So if you had a loved one or someone in your life who was a good candidate for a GLP-1 agonist, what would be your sort of elevator pitch or like your main bullet points to kind of summarize why they should take it and what you'd recommend for them to do while they're taking it? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few few things that, you know, it would be good for them to be aware of before they even start, right? Um, again, how these, how these drugs work, at least at the level of they're primarily going to work by reducing your appetite. Right? So you're not going to you're not going to feel the need or the desire to eat as much food, which makes it really important that the food that you eat is high quality. So I think education around diet quality should be, you know, near the top of the list because you're going to eat less. So it's really important that what you do eat is high quality food. And part of that is making sure that you get sufficient protein in your diet. Right. So following not only the, the quality of the food that you eat, but but to some extent, at least macros, you know, grossly speaking. Um, resistance training. So again, if you do not <laughs> do some form of resistance training, it is almost certain that you will lose both lean mass and fat mass as you lose weight. And there are lots of reasons why you don't want that to happen. So resistance training, I would add, and this is something I haven't seen a lot of people talk about, you know, regular blood work that goes beyond what you're going to get at your primary care physician. So sure, you want to know if your HbA1c is going in the right direction and your insulin and glucose and your lipids. You also probably want to know what's happening to your hormones because caloric restriction is one of the most profound ways to lead to a reduction in testosterone and dysregulation in hormonal profiles. So I would pay attention to hormones for sure and take steps if your hormones are getting, you know, out of out of range to fix that. You know, essential vitamins, things like that. Also, pay more attention because you're going to be in a nutrient restricted state. Um so I guess those are the kinds of things I would I would think about um and uh and also make make sure that people know, you know, if you start this and it, 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 it's likely that you will need to stay on these drugs maybe for the rest of your life in order to maintain the weight loss. But one of the ways that you can you can take steps to increase your chance of being able to come off the drugs is to develop habits around both nutrition and exercise as part of as part of the process of starting this journey, right? In other words, look at it as an opportunity where these drugs can be used as an aid to get you to a better health span trajectory and to develop habits that are sustainable where if it's important to you to be able to come off of these drugs, you give yourself the opportunity to. Again, learning what a high quality diet looks like, learning what portions to calories look like, making sure you're consuming enough protein, resistance training, how to do it, how to do it effectively. I think these drugs and used in that context can be quite powerful because one of the hard things, if you go to somebody who has not, you know, ever developed healthy lifestyle habits and has gotten to a point where, you know, they are overweight or obese, sedentary, you know, may probably not sleeping real well, maybe already hormonally dysregulated, one of the real challenges is just 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 seeing a, a positive effect when you try to start a lifestyle modification. I think these drugs can help because they're gonna they're gonna be an aid in bringing down the appetite piece, right? And potentially other again effects on inflammation, things like that that may or may not be directly due to the caloric intake. So if you approach it from that perspective and get training and knowledge on how to adopt a healthy lifestyle, how to eat a healthy diet, how to exercise effectively, they can be, that can be quite powerful. So that's the other piece of the puzzle I think it would be great for people to have a little bit more education around. Okay, so having said all of that, um, do they affect the biology of aging? So they affect multiple age-related diseases in overweight and obese people. One question is, would they have the same effect on those diseases in normal weight people? I don't think we know the answer to that. Uh, another question is, if they are affecting biological aging, is it only a caloric restriction effect or is it something else in addition to a caloric restriction effect? That's super interesting to me. I also don't think we know the answer there. The last thing I'll say, uh, because, because I'm talking a lot and you've got questions to ask me, but the last thing I'll say is, um, I sort of feel like you know, uh, 
there's pretty good reason to believe that um, obesity to some extent and diabetes to a, to a much greater extent uh, likely accelerate the biological aging process, right? So if you take a normal weight person and you move them into the obese range and they become metabolically dysfunctional on the path to diabetes, I think there's pretty good evidence that that leads to an acceleration of what we call biological aging. And so again, in that context, those people are aging more rapidly and become at higher risk of developing essentially all of the diseases of aging at a younger chronological age. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you take a population that is aging at an accelerated rate because they are metabolically challenged and you then cause them to eat less and that suppresses their metabolic dysfunction, that is also going to reduce the risk of developing essentially all age-related diseases, which I think is the most likely explanation for why we are seeing that obese people who are on GLP-1 agonists are at lower risk for multiple age-related diseases. I expect this will continue. We will see that they are at lower risk for dementia. We will see that they are at lower risk for cancer. We will see that they are at lower risk for liver disease, right? All of these diseases of aging that are accelerated by metabolic dysfunction will be suppressed by GLP-1 agonists. It's an interesting question and this is where I think if you had the data, it would be interesting to look. If you could look at the individual level, there are people who are obese who do not develop metabolic disease. In those individuals, does, do these drugs reduce their risk of other age-related diseases? I actually don't know. I can't really predict what the answer to that would be. I don't think we've got enough data yet to know for sure. Um, so that's sort of, those are the questions that I think about. And I think some of them, you know, Maybe the studies haven't been done, but we already know the answers. Some of them, we just don't know the answers yet. Hmm.